Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's seminar. Um, I'm Natalie Pereira, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Education Policy Institute. We're an independent research charity that looks at um, how to improve education and young people's mental health outcomes from birth right through to um, adulthood and entry into the labour market. A very, very warm welcome from, um, from us at EPI today. We're gathered here to talk about the school's bill, as it is now. First day it's being introduced into the House of Lords today. We were due to have Baroness Barron give the keynote, but given she is introducing it in the House of Lords, she's got a very good excuse for not being here. Um, so the school's bill, how can it deliver opportunity for all? For, I think it's safe to say that for several years, probably decades, we've all been debating and discussing the kind of three key, uh, three key themes that run through the school's right paper and now the bill. The recruitment and retention of high quality teachers, how to raise standards for pupils and narrow the gap between the most disadvantaged and their peers, and whether mass academisation will help us deliver those outcomes of um, higher standards and greater equality. We've got a great lineup for you this afternoon. Um, we'll have, in a moment, we'll have Claire uh, McDonald from the uh, Department for Education. Claire was a lead author of the School's White Paper, so we'll have plenty to say about its background and its aims. Um, and then following that, we have a panel, and I'll introduce them to you when we get to that point. And then finally from me, a big thank you to colleagues at Capita for hosting the event today. We're very grateful for, uh, for you having us here. And I'm going to hand over now to Andy Stark, who's the Chief Executive of Capita. And uh, a very warm Great. welcome on uh, behalf of me and my team uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, our headquarters office here in, uh, uh, in Capita. Um, we're, uh, we're absolutely delighted that the EPI asked us to uh, support this event. Um, all we're actually doing is providing, uh, is, is providing with tea and biscuits in the location. Um, but to a, certain, to, to a certain extent, the role we're playing is a little bit like the role that we play more widely within the education sector with the people who sit in the background uh, providing you with the, with the IT and the software and, uh, and the supporting services that enables uh, education to execute seamlessly. And our goal is to try to make uh, lives of teachers uh, more uh, easier, uh, to make government uh, be able to stretch their taxpayers' pound further, uh, and to help uh, improve delivering high-quality personalised learning. Today, we're one of the largest education uh, and learning businesses in the UK. Uh, we provide uh, scalable uh, education technology uh, uh, services for schools uh, and uh, for academies and for higher, educational, uh, higher education bodies uh, and deliver those services to hundreds, and hundreds of thousands of children across the UK. We deliver IT connectivity, uh, equipments and solutions uh, in every corner of, of the UK. Uh, often within, uh, with partnerships with, uh, uh, with big organisations like Microsoft. And we provide consultancy and workforce uh, services uh, to help, uh, help the development of teachers and educationalists uh, across the country. Uh, finally, and most recently, uh, we're really proud and delighted to be delivering uh, the, Tur uh, the Turing service, promoting Turing, uh, the Turing scheme uh, across the country and helping make sure that it's administ administered efficiently. So, so as a business, we're really proud of what we do in education. And personally, I'm very proud of what we do in education uh, because for the last 10 years, in addition to my day job, uh, I've also been the chair of a further education college. Whilst I know something about education, uh, my knowledge pales into insignificance uh, when compared to the uh, august panel that you have in front of us. Uh, a collection of people who, when you look through their bios, have not only excelled uh, as teachers, then head teachers, but have gone on to, to, uh, to have uh, wide-ranging roles uh, in education uh, and in policy uh, and to become CEOs, professors and commissioners. The topic we have today is a really interesting one and I'm really excited to hear what our panellists have to say about the first schools bill in six years. 
And who could argue with uh, the overall objective of the bill? Who would, who would argue with the desire of giving better opportunities for every student? But I guess the question we're all interested in hearing this afternoon is whether it's deliverable. And I guess to start off that discussion and debate, who better placed uh, than our keynote speaker today because she helped write the bill. Uh, so I'll, uh, with great pleasure, hand over to Claire McDonald. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm clearly not Minister Barron. It is the occupational hazard of having such a timely conference that means that the Minister is actually engaged in the House of Lords at the moment in the debate. Um, but I am uh, the Deputy Director for School Strategy at the Department for Education. And what that means is I led the team who wrote the school's white paper and am now working very closely on the school's bill. So it's great to be here with you today. And the Minister did ask me to pass on her sincere apologies. Nothing other than standing up in front of the House of Lords um, would have prevented her from being here today. So I think we should be able to have a really interesting conversation. And um, I am as interested in the conversation with the panel um, and getting to that bit of the conversation. So as I'm sure we'll discuss throughout the course of the event, the white paper and then the bill have got some extremely ambitious objectives, um, particularly centered around reading, writing and maths. And if you listen to the Secretary of State for Education speak, he'll say he is absolutely unapologetic about being that ambitious for all children and young people in this country and a sense that what are we all collectively here for working in the education sector if it is not to achieve those outcomes. But I think that does mean that certainly for me as someone working in the department and for the whole of the system, it requires being really clear and really focused and thinking, what are the programmes? What are the things that will really shift the dial? What will really make a change to those outcomes? So if I think about where the white paper starts and not so much a focus for the bill but in terms of the sort of narrative of the, of the white paper that is centered and it starts with the teacher um, and i'm clearly not a teacher so i would like to start just by saying for those of you that are i have the greatest respect and admiration for what you do and the incredibly hard work and the challenges that you've been facing over the last couple of years and that i know continue so i just wanted to put that acknowledgement out there to start what the white paper really says is it continues the reform journey that the government has been putting in place over the last couple of years and saying that um, continuous professional development and that golden thread of continuous professional development is one of the best things that we can do to support our teachers. And so some of the relevant things that the white paper talks about are, for example, new national professional qualifications, a new leading literacy qualification. But it goes broader than that to look at um, for example, those who are leading roles around behaviour and culture, looking at the training and support of the early years workforce, so really taking a, a holistic approach. One of the other things that we've put more detail about, out about following the white paper is the levelling up premiums that will go to support um, increased payments for teachers in shortage subjects in those areas of the country that really need it most. So I think when we look at opportunity for all and levelling up opportunities, that's a particularly key part of the white paper. The second part of the white paper, and this is where we start to get into what the bill is talking about as well, um, it looks at the importance of a broad and rich curriculum, um, in talking, including talking about the role of the new uh, curriculum body, building on Oak's work in the pandemic. And although the guiding mission of the white paper is around literacy and numeracy, what chapter two of the white paper really tries to make clear is that breadth is incredibly important to government. So it talks about cultural opportunities, the arts, foreign languages. Um, it talks about the things that we know are actually most important to young people and their parents, including mental health support. Um, there's a lot of focus on literacy and numeracy, rightly, um, but the white paper isn't solely focused on that. And the white paper also talks in that chapter about a new set of measures on attendance. And that's what you see now really clearly set out in the proposals of the bill around the children not in school register, around the responsibilities that local authorities have in terms of collecting that information, in terms of a clearer set of expectations on schools and consistency in terms of standards that we hope will really support schools in building back attendance levels after the pandemic. The third chapter of the white paper really builds on the investment we've made during the pandemic to support children to catch up in our recovery programmes 
And what it really does is signal the intention to embed the interventions that we know work, so where things like high quality tutoring are incredibly effective in supporting young people to catch up. It's saying we know the recovery journey is going to be a long one, um, but we hope we will get to a place where we reach the end of that journey and actually when we reach that end we want to see those programmes like tutoring being embedded as part of what we think is a normal way of working in the system going forward and that is very much what the parent pledge that's set out in chapter three of the white paper talks about. And then in chapter four of the white paper and I'm sure where a lot of our discussion will focus today we're looking at the wider system that underpins the changes that are set out in other chapters. And there's clearly the headline ambition set out there that all schools should be part of a strong academy trust by 2030. And I know that if the minister was here, she would have the word strong in bold and underlined. And I think what I would expect her to articulate for you is that um, her journey as part of the white paper wasn't about starting with the question of um, should all schools become academies or how do we make all schools become academies but it was saying if our ambitions for young people are this 90% ambition around key stage 2 are this transformation in GCSE outcomes then what is it going to take in order to get us there and what is the system leadership that is going to be required in order to really sped, spread that best practice and those transformational outcomes across the country and that is where the ambition around all schools being part of a strong trust comes from Quite a lot of chapter four of the white paper um, is about that journey and about how we bring people, all of you in this room hopefully, with us on that journey. Um, and some of those things aren't about legislation. So um, one of the things in the white paper that's generated quite a lot of discussion is uh, the ability of uh, local authorities to establish new academy trusts. Um, and that actually isn't a legislative change, but a policy one, um, and one that we're already starting to have really exciting conversations with local authority leaders about since the white paper was published. But there are a whole set of things set out in chapter four that you do now see reflected in the schools bill. So that's on the basis that we have a legislative and a regulatory framework that was designed uh, when academies were a small number of schools. It was designed when they were a minority and certainly not a majority or intending them to be the entirety of the system going forwards. So what are the things that we need to put in place now to make sure that we can have confidence that that system is robust going forward. So one of the things, um, one of the key measures, I think the first measure um, in, uh, in the schools bill and one I'm sure we'll have discussions about um, is about academy standards. So the idea that we would translate um, what is currently in funding agreements or set out through guidance um, in the academy um, trust handbook um, that that would be established um, as part of statute through a series of academy standards. Um, I expect we will have a conversation about that later, um, and I, uh, because I know it has generated a lot of debate amongst um, many of the uh, multi-academy trust leaders I've spoken to over the last 10 days. And I would say that the intention, very much around those standards, is to provide a robust foundation and to translate the existing requirements um, on academy trusts into something that is governed by statute. I think there has been a lot of discussion about the breadth of those powers and the potential for them to be used in a range of ways. Um, what I'd say in response to that is that the Secretary of State's current powers to change funding agreements and make alterations are in fact very broad and sweeping at the moment and without the potential for parliamentary debate, which we're proposing for a, not just the passage of the bill but um, affirmative votes on all future sets of regulations on academy standards. Just a brief deviation into academy standards there. Um, just moving finally away from uh, the specifics of the bill, I think in the, in the context of opportunity for all, it would be remiss of me not to mention education investment areas um, as the way in the white paper we're proposing on a geographic basis to target some of our interventions to make sure that support gets to those who are most in need of it. Um, and work is already starting to begin in those areas um, with local conversations happening with a whole range of local partners, which are really exciting. And in terms of what next, clearly um, the schools bill um, is in its reading today and will be progressing through Parliament. Um, in terms of the policy work of the department, we're planning on very shortly publishing an implementation framework which will set out some more detail, um, particularly relating to the systems, chapter four of the white paper, and giving local partners more information about how we can work on them with the work with them on the next steps um, of the white paper going forwards. So 
returning just to the theme of the conference, it's important to acknowledge that, of course, neither the school's white paper nor the school's bill themselves do anything to achieve opportunity for all, which um, I, I am absolutely clear on uh, in my position as a government official. It's about how they're turned into a reality by working with all of those who have uh, a responsibility to deliver for young people. And that's what I'm looking forward to discussing with you for the rest of the session. Thanks. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, great. Um, so I would like now to introduce um, our panel. If I start from the far left, really delighted to introduce uh, Julie McCulloch, who is the Director of Policy at the Association of School and College Leaders. And Julie has had a very esteemed career in education, publishing and policy. Um, so before joining ASPL in 2017, Julie held role, uh, another role at uh, ASPL as well as in uh, Pearson as well. Um, next to Julie, uh, who probably needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway, so David Carter, who's the former National Schools Commissioner and current school trust advisor. Sir so David King became the first South West Regional Schools Commissioner in 2014 and then the National Schools Commissioner in 2015. And then between 2018 and 2021, he was the Director of System Leadership at the uh, Ambition Institute. So uh, warm welcome to you. Um, immediately uh, next to uh, David, we have Professor Dame Alison Peacock, there's a lot of fancy titles in this panel, which I do not apologise for. Um, Alison is the Chief Executive of the Chartered College of Teaching, and prior to that was the Executive Head Teacher of a school in Hertfordshire, and her career to date has, has spanned primary, <coughs> secondary and advisory uh, roles as well. Um, you've already met Andy and Claire, um, so I will move us on then to... Um, uh, John Murphy, who is the CEO of Oasis Community Learning, which is a multi-academy trust with 52 primary and secondary academies. And John was appointed to Oasis in September 2014 and has over three decades in school leadership. So we'll go down the panel first and give um, some of the members who you haven't heard from yet uh, the opportunity to make two to three minutes of opening remarks, reflecting on their thoughts about the content of the school's bill and whether it does or whether it will address some of the challenges that we know um, young people are facing today. And then I will open up the floor to questions. So please uh, start to think about what you might like to ask our panel members. Um, so Julie, I'll start with you. Thanks, Natalie. Can everybody hear okay? Great. I don't have a fancy title. I feel like I need to acquire some in this, in this present company. But thank you very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you this afternoon. So Natalie sent us a, a series of questions to think about when we were preparing what to talk about today. I actually decided to start with your last question, Natalie, which was what more is needed to raise standards, reduce learning losses and close the disadvantage gaps? So I'm going to start from there and then come back to what's actually in the white paper, because I think it's important that we think broadly as well as specifically about, about the white paper and the schools bill. So from our perspective at ASCO, our view really is that the role of government should be to enable schools to focus on teaching and learning and that they should do that by the government focusing on clearing other stuff out of the way basically. And I think that there are a number of aspects of levelling up, if we want to call it like that, that we would like to see more of in the white paper and the bill. And I know some people might say a schools bill isn't the place for this, but I think again it's about setting that context. What we would like to see more around are what we think are the big issues, listening to our members, that are stopping children and young people from succeeding at the moment. Number one, I would say poverty. You know, look at some stats around poverty. We've got, this is back in 2019-20, uh, nine children in a class of 30 were living in poverty. That's 30% of children and young people. 49% of children in single parent families are living in poverty. And 75% of children in poverty have at least one working parent. 
And we know from the work that EPI and others have done about the, the clear link between poverty and educational standards. So we'd have seen, like to have seen more around that. The second issue that comes up when we talk to our members is about the decimation of children's support services that we've seen over the last few years. Uh, there was a report that came out from the Children's Society just yesterday uh, that talked about about one in six, six to 16 year olds having a probable mental health issue at the moment. Um, 1.5 million under 18s will need help with their mental health as a direct result of COVID. And we've seen a 15% increase in referrals to CAMS in the last year. So again, if we're looking at levelling up, if we're looking about helping uh, children and young people to succeed, we'd like to see more of that. I recognise there is a little bit of that in terms of um, mental health support training for teachers, but nowhere near enough. Um, and the third issue that we hear from our members is around the ongoing and worsening teachers' supply crisis. Again, looking at very, very recent figures that have just come out from NFER on that. Uh, we know that the government's missing its targets in traditional shortest subjects like physics, maths and modern foreign languages, but also for the first time at the moment in English. Uh, teacher retention rates have fallen back to pre-pandemic levels and teachers' real-time pay is lower than a decade ago. All of these things play into our ability to attract and retain the, the highest quality teachers, which again has, we know, a huge impact on the life chances of children and young people. So the White Paper and the Schools Bill um, have something to say about these issues, particularly about teacher supply. Claire alluded to, to some of that. Um, so we know that we're going to see the continuation of the early career framework. There's some more funding for national professional qualifications. The government will deliver, um, albeit a year late, on its manifesto commitment to raise the teacher starting salary uh, to £30,000. Um, and there's that levelling up premium that Claire mentioned for shortage subjects, teachers and shortage subjects in certain areas. So there are some steps there in the right direction, but, but nowhere near enough. What we, we do have um, in the white paper and the bill is clearly a, a, def a, a determination from the government to, to finish an agenda that's been taking up a huge amount of its time and a huge amount of school and college leaders' time for years now, uh, you know, the, the desire for all schools to be able to academy trusts. We think that's probably inevitable at this point, um, probably necessary, given that we're probably close to that, that tipping point of uh, really needing a single system there for schools, you know, whatever your kind of ideological viewpoint on that. We're sceptical about whether it will be as transformational as the government thinks it will be. There seems to be an awful lot hanging off that, that, uh, that move. Um, there's some necessary and some much needed changes in the, the, the Schools Bill and the White Paper. The move towards a direct national funding formula, formula something that ASCO has been campaigning for, for for many years. Great to see that. Um, the regulation of unregulated schools, also really important. There are some things there that I think are gimmicky. I think the parent pledge is a gimmick. I think the 32 and a half hour school week is a gimmick. And I'm happy to talk more about that later if people would like me to. And we are concerned as an organisation about those academy standards that Claire referenced. Um, I do take the point that quite a lot of that is around bringing together uh, regulations that are already scattered across different bits of legislation and bringing those together is probably helpful. There, does, there is an awful lot in there, there are an awful lot of powers that that sets out the Secretary of State having around curriculum, about school holidays, about procedures for appointing and, um, and assigning staff to particular roles. We're not convinced that those are all roles that should be held by government. So, summary from me, I guess. I think there are some necessary changes in the white paper. There's a bit more playing to the crowd, perhaps, than we might like to have seen. Um, and there's a, a lack of recognition for us of some of those bigger societal issues that we think are what we really need to address in order to level up and tackle disadvantage. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to see some familiar faces again after all this time. So I, I'll approach this if I can in two ways. I'll do some very quick general thoughts about the about the bill, and then talk about the first two questions, which I guess are the ones you probably would expect me to, to have a view about. Um, the, the, the the white paper, in some respects, confirm what I've always thought: that, that, that there is a lexicon in the DfE of titles for white papers um, that goes back 15 years to Every Child Matters, right the way through to this one, which is Opportunities for All. The no shit Sherlock policy that you couldn't possibly disagree with, but actually is highly aspirational. I think the serious point about this is that the aspiration uh, that sits within the white paper will only become a reality 
give schools and trusts delivery. Um, the DfE will, will, will be able to enable some of this, it will be able to drive some of this through some of this investments, but at the classroom level, it'll be school teachers and leaders in our schools, governors and trustees, who will make this happen or not. And that's one of the really big themes about this this evening, I think, which is where is the capacity going to come from to enable us to do that? The first question posed, how feasible is it to have all schools in MATS by 2030? Um, and I think this will be a challenge because I think the department has very few levers to make this happen. Um, the number of schools who are failing in the system compared to where we were in 2010 up to when the Regional Schools Commission started in 2014 is remarkably few. And whilst one can never be complacent about that, um, if, if we think we're going to get to all schools becoming academies through that route, that's not going to happen. So we have to think differently about what the compelling reason is going to be for why good and outstanding schools should choose to give up what they would review, I, I guess, as their independence or their autonomy in favour of joining a trust. And I, I like the argument that we talk about the way that we commission good schools to come and add capacity to our trusts. That we don't just collect good schools because it looks good in our stats, but because they have a particular uh, role or a particular strength or track record that the trust that you might be leading at the moment doesn't have. Uh, but I still think that's going to be quite a challenging argument. But that's the kind of conversation that's going to have to start very soon if this aspiration for 2030 is going to be delivered. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that I think there is a capacity issue. We have to be really careful, I think, and not fall into the trap that assuming uh, that all of the best practice in the sector sits in the academy room, because it doesn't. There is still some incredibly good leadership and teaching happening in the maintained sector. Um, and one of the reasons why we have this bill is that we've got an extremely complex, messy system. No country in the world would design the education system to look like it does today. But it's where we are, it's the legacy that we've got. And we have to find a way, I think, whether it's through partnerships or through different types of family structures that, that we've talked about in the past, how do we get the strongest practice in the maintained sector to impact upon academies and vice versa? Because this debate that we've had now for probably nearly 20 years about academies good, maintain bad, or the other way around, depending upon your point of view, is just a waste of time and destructive. The capacity issue as I see it sits around two main things. One is around leadership. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm still really proud to be associated with the Ambition Institute is the quality of the leadership development that that organisation amongst others delivers. But we have to do more of that. Uh, and we have to be thinking more about how do we grow the next cadre of leaders. But we also have to do the same thing about people who are trustees and governors. And, and some, of the, some of the really poor practice that I saw in multi-academy trusts were a product of bad governance. Um, and we've got to do something about that and make sure that uh, when you remember it's a voluntary role, but if you're a chair of trustees in a matter of 25 schools, it is not one day a fortnight. It's two or three days a week. And whether that means we have to start thinking about remunerating people for doing that role or we have to find some other way of making that job doable, we should be looking at some of those issues. And there is a risk challenge about all schools becoming academies by 2030. And the risk is this, that the Sun Trusts, they see the word growth in great big neon lights. And the word growth means we don't have to make any difficult financial decisions anymore because we'll get more schools in. And it's a cop out. So the risk could be that the wrong trusts grow too quickly and therefore the children in their trusts who they've already made a promise to get left behind in favour of the new schools and the new children that will join. And, and the DfE and the regional directors, quasi-RSEs, are going to have to be really good at doing that. I'm not against the idea of local authority trusts. Uh, and, I, and I hope the answer to this is that they will only be grown in areas where there is not enough capacity and that we'll not see local authority trusts go from zero to 50 in a fortnight. They should be treated the same as anybody else's trust in the country, given three or four schools to prove their track record with, and then we'll see where we go from there. So I'm not against that, but we need to be careful about it. And then my final point relates probably to question two, which was about the outcomes. So will simply joining a MAT raise outcomes? The answer is no. I haven't seen a single structure in the 40 years I've been in education that on its own, and as of itself, raise standards. But the vehicle, uh, which I'm incredibly passionate about, in the right hands with the right leadership and governance can really change the lives of young people. And there's been a lot of talk about strong trusts, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Claire, you mentioned this before, that Baroness Barron might have used that word. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately, about what are the indicators of a strong trust. So if you'll bear with me, I'll go through them quite quickly. But there are seven. So if you, if you, if you just want to write one to seven on the side of your piece of paper, 
this is not a great big reveal, this is just a personal view. Number one is, strong trusts have a very clear values and culture um, ethos. They understand what it is they, they believe in, and they're able to articulate that both across the trust and within the individual schools. I haven't seen an organisation that I've been employed by or supported or worked with that isn't really strong on what it believes in, and, and a trust should absolutely be the same. Number two is, you need a plan. We need a strategy. We don't need a three-year development plan. You can have that if you want. You can have a five-year one if you want. But you need a plan. You need to get an idea of how you're going to get from A to B. How is the trust going to improve, and how is it going to sustain that improvement? Number three, strong trusts have expert professional governance. And the people who are working in the trust as employees are part of that professional governance, not just the people who are trustees and working at local level. But getting governance really clear at board level and local level uh, is really essential. Uh, if we're going to lead strong trust. Number four, the, the focus of the leadership has to be on outcomes. Now, one of the things that we talk about a lot of, the white paper talks about, is outcomes. Um, and of course, that's the nature of the, of the document. But outcomes are the results of what you put into it. And so the quality decision-making around strategy is what will make the difference to young people in this country. It doesn't really matter to me whether it's 2030 or 2025 or 2050. But unless we get the right input, we'll measure the wrong things coming out. Number five, the big debate for trust at the moment is this spectrum between autonomy and alignment. And, and I'm sick to death of hearing people tell me about their autonomy. Because when I started being a head teacher in 1997 in Gloucestershire, I was not an autonomous head. I had a local authority, a senior advisor, and a board of governors who were absolutely sure that I was challenged about my decision making. So autonomy, for me, is a word that we use to enable adults to carry on doing what they've always done and not thinking about kids getting a better deal. So we need to be clear in the trust sector about what are we aligning around, where do you want the common threads to be across your schools, and where do you want the individual school leadership teams to have the element of creativity that is right for their context. Number six, just two more to go and I'll stop. There needs to be this focus on capacity, and I think it has to be driven through talent management. And CPD has mentioned a lot, of course that's important, but talent management is the overarching structure that enables CPD to, th to, to, to thrive. And talent management has to be about identification, development and then deployment. And how are we going to think about that? And too often CPD development is about what we need today, not what we need in three years' time. We have to be thinking, I think, ahead of what we, the kind of workforce we need to grow. And then finally, the last but certainly not least, is the financial strategy. We have to think that every single pound that we spend has to be focused upon improving the lives and the chances of kids. So if you want to spend um, 250,000 pounds on refurbing your reception in school, go ahead but you have a hard job convincing me that's going to raise outcomes. So how, at times, when economic challenges are around us, do we make sure that our financial strategy meets the needs of our most vulnerable children? If we get that right, we have a chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I could see people furiously get, getting out their notepads when you uh, were about to go through your seven points, including members of my own team, which is what we could do. Um, Alison, over to you. Thank you. I, I believe Academisation is not the answer, but coherence and collaboration is. So we've had a mess in the last 10 years, the way in which schools have either been in or out, whether they've been local authority schools or academies. I think that argument is tired. I think people are fed up with the argument. Actually, what we need, what makes the difference in schools, is the quality of teachers. It's the quality of leadership. And great teachers need resources in order to teach. So we have aspiration in the white paper. No one's going to argue with the aspiration. Except maybe there is a bit of a challenge when it says right at the beginning, 16% of our youngsters have special educational needs. But 90% of our youngsters at the end of primary school need to achieve the expected standard. Not quite sure how that works. But anyway, let's have high, really high aspirations, high expectations, but we do need resources to enable this to happen. Now, the big resource that doesn't need to be legislated for in the schools bill, and it, which is an incredibly welcome resource, is the resource around professional learning. You'd expect me to say that as the Chief Executive of the Chartered College of Teaching, a new professional body. Obviously, all that I'm interested in is how do we get the best possible teachers intellectually really ready to be in the classroom, to teach in the way that they need to teach. How can we build that expertise? So I'm really delighted about the golden thread, except that 
I want to go beyond the golden thread because the golden thread speaks to me quite a lot about compliance. We're talking about re-regulating initial teacher training providers. We're providing the early career framework and it's very welcome that we've got that time, but it's also very tightly controlled. And then the new professional programs that are being offered welcome as they are, are still very tightly monitored. So I want to make sure that alongside all of this free professional learning, we're building the criticality that our teachers need to be true professionals, that they can take the learning they're being offered, they can contextualize it, they can engage in phrenesis, they can use their intuition alongside their expertise to really build a standard of professionalism which will hold our schools in the best possible position to enable these standards that we want to achieve. Because it's teachers that transform lives, not school structures. And I think we really need to hold on to the fact that if our teaching workforce feels undervalued, if it feels underpaid, if it feels that actually they're just cogs in the machine, they're just following through and then we follow the next program and then we follow the next program and we join the dots, everything will be all right. It won't. Learning is complex. So of course, there's been a lot of development in professional learning over the years. Cognitive science has taught us a lot about how children learn, about effective ways to teach, but we need to make sure all of this comes to life in the classroom, in the hands of true professionals. In terms of the greater regulation for academies, I can see why that's needed. When I was on a head teacher board, for example, I could see that actually this is an incredibly difficult position, from the position of regional um, schools commissioner, to try and regulate all of these schools and to try and make sure that every school was in the best possible position. So I can see why these um, regulations are needed. I think I agree with Julie, though, that there's a degree of worry about the level of control from the centre. But to summarise really, um, in terms of raising standards, which is something that we all want, it's something that's been on the agenda ever since I started teaching, which is quite a long time ago now. It's something that is, is always the aspiration of every government. And if you think back to that Labour initiative of the primary literacy strategy and the primary numeracy strategy, they were incredibly in controlling initiatives and actually really and truly didn't take us to where we needed to be. It is about building the professionalism, professional learning, as I've said. So to summarise, building teacher knowledge, enabling our teachers, keeping our teachers happy, thanking our teachers, giving our teachers recognition for the best that they can do, supported by fantastic leaders. That's everything that the Charter College is all about, and I hope it's everything that you're about. Whether you're in a mat, whether you're in a local authority, wherever you are, your local school really matters. And just to say, finally, on the parent pledge, mutual respect is what's needed. I'm not sure signing a pledge makes the difference, but where we can build mutual respect between families and schools, that's where we get the progress. Thank you. Lovely, Alison. Thank you. Andy, did you want to say a few words? Um, just, just, a, just a couple of couple of observations. Firstly, um, the panelists' conversations around uh, looking at uh, reducing poverty and looking at um, whole life outcomes is critical. Um, we we do a um, education is is a fifth of my business, uh, but we run uh, we run a large uh, portion of the back office of of the, of, of the running of the country including 350 local councils, uh, including running uh, a lot of the health and welfare services that you're familiar with. What we notice is a desperate need to be joined up from the perspective of the individual uh, and from the perspective of the family. If, uh, if you can provide joined up services to the family such that uh, um, uh, students are coming to school having had a safe, uh, a safe family environment uh, that that is well supported, then they will do better in schools. So I think I think looking at joined up uh, uh, joined up services is a pretty a pretty good thought. Uh, the other thought that uh, I, I welcomed in the uh, in the white paper the references to improving the availability of Wi-Fi and broadband, uh, but I think there is an opportunity 
uh, within education to, uh, to try uh, to work harder to reduce the burden upon teachers. And technology is a massive opportunity for that, uh, which doesn't necessarily come out at, the, at least at the macro level, but I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it in the detail. But I think technology potentially uh, is one of the vehicles that can be used to help ease up capacity and allow teachers to focus on, on, uh, on their students rather than focusing on administration and governance. Um, so uh, there might be a couple of those. Great, thank you. We'll hear from Claire. I'll give you the right to reply to the whole panel mm -hmm. in a moment after we've heard from John and before we bring in audience questions. But Claire, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm sitting here as a CEO of a multi-academy trust and in many respects I feel what I'm doing is representing the 4,483 staff who work in our organisation and the 32,000 young people that we serve in our communities. Just under 50% of our students come from high, highly disadvantaged families and uh, the outcomes that we want to achieve for them, we are as ambition, we share the ambition that's been shared by the whole panel today with the communities we serve. It's interesting, isn't it, that what's the purpose of education? Why are we here? When we see the white paper and we feel as passionately about what we want to be able to create, is I, I think we ignore, when we're talking about levelling up and we're living in a capitalist society, I think that's quite an interesting concept in itself. When we're talking in, uh, about education in the UK and then we've got grammar schools, we've got private schools, we've got selective schools, we've got faith schools, we've got a completely divided education system. So as much as I believe we ought to have a pluralist approach, I think we're ignoring some of the issues that actually create the divisions in society that we've got. And so the conversation between local authorities and MATS, I happened to chair the MAT Partnership North conference last week, and in that conference was 155 CEOs. And I was really humbled to be able to chair that. But actually what I heard over those two days was about a leadership of hope. If we think about the last two years, we've had the pandemic, suddenly we're supposed to snap back like a rubber band back into where we were before. When actually many of our leaders are dealing with recovering education and our leaders are trying to make sense of actually what's happened on a personal level for all of us. We've dealt with the death of Sarah Everard and what that means for us. We've dealt with you know, the issues coming from the death of, um, of uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matters. So I think the thing that we should be talking about is actually what is the purpose of education? What's the society we're trying to create? And at the moment, we go between all these swings, don't we, between, well, it must be about a knowledge-rich curriculum, or then we hear it must be about skills. Actually, I think it's about the development of human potential. That's what I fundamentally believe. And that's what we all know in our own life stories, isn't it? How have we grown up? What's been our life experience, etc. So when you look at the white paper, I think it answers some issues. I think that when you answer some of the questions that come on to, that we've been asked, you know, will it be feasible by 2030? A target really doesn't change an awful lot. I think as Sir David Carter said, it requires a strategic plan. It requires a really mature conversation between educational leaders in this country. I think there's certain obstacles to it, funding. And then there's the opportunity where, for example, a good school can leave a mat. Well, where will we be on the academy's journey? And when I wrote to Baroness Barron, I didn't get the clarity I wanted back in terms of the response. I think when we're talking about multi-academy trusts, the way that we talk about ourselves in the Oasis Community Learning is that we're a family and we're greater by the sum of our parts. Now I started off making all the mistakes that other multi-academy trust leaders made. For example, we had lots of different curriculum in lots of different schools and we were lucky to have the right leaders in the right schools. We now have one curriculum which is co-constructed with all our leaders which allow us to make those necessary changes and quality adjustments across the piece. That's about being greater by the sum of our parts. Again, I agree with Sir David Carter because I think it's about really good governance. How do you accelerate change? How do you get a governing body who can have a real oversight to make sure we can make the changes in our communities? I would have wanted to hear more in the white paper about early years. We know that so many of our children's chances and opportunities are locked in by the age of seven. What are we doing for those families, for example, who need that support? In Oasis, we provide food pantries. We provide adult education. If we go to the question, for example, well, how are we going to make a difference around uh, um, 
around uh, parents who are supposed to, to engage their children's learning. Well, of course, that needs to be differentiated. We need our parents to have digital access. We need to make sure that our parents can speak English and can access that curriculum. We need to make sure that parents' literacy is addressed. And I think the thing that I'd really wanted to see in the white paper is our civic duty explored. Our civic duty explored. What's the contribution that our schools can make if they can break down those barriers, serve the communities, and really be the hubs that they deserve to be? Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Claire, I want to give you the opportunity to come back to any of the points um, that we've heard from the panel just now before we open up to questions. Um, but one of the themes that came up from Julie and from Alison, and actually that we also heard at our levelling up conference last week in Parliament, was the role of government, and Julie talked about, and we had almost exactly the same words from a panellist last week, about government needing to get out of the way. What are your thoughts on the, the, the role of government set against, you know, more, and sorry to use this word again, David, more autonomy for, uh, for small leaders? Thanks very much, and uh, it, was, uh, it was so helpful to hear that conversation. I think it was um, such interesting reflection. I wouldn't say that I disagree with anything um, at all that I've heard, and I think, it is the, I think it is the perennial challenge of government. Um, I was going to say I don't think government has ever tried to do anything other than get out of the way. I'm not. I'm not quite sure that that's true. But I think that um, that balance and that challenge in terms of you know what central control is necessary. What are what are the risks of you know where government gets out of the way? What are the risks that we need um, to control for? That we need to regulate for? You know what are what is the space that it is legitimate for government to be in and where should it be taking a step back? Um, I think that there's there's nothing in the white paper and there's sort of never a bit of work that's done in government um, that doesn't seriously consider that um, as a sort of as a spectrum and where there are tensions between um, uh, you know what you uh, what you lose in terms of some of the kind of flourishing of innovation or diversity of ideas, um, the kind of whether there are the benefits to that versus where are um, where are the risks if you allow that to, to go ahead unchecked. I think David sort of uh, you know set out a, a challenge there around um, what autonomy can look like. So uh, you know I would just say I, I think that is one of the central challenges of policy making. Um, you know that is that is always the intent to take that duty very seriously and to to balance those risks. Um, you know we don't always get it right, and I think the challenge is really welcome. Uh, just, just picking up on uh, a couple of points, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Julie in terms of the, the wider societal challenges, um, and I uh, would just say that you know the whole of government and the department in its work is incredibly um, cognizant of that, and it is a, a very large part of our thinking. Um, I think uh, the Secretary of State, when we were developing the white paper, was very clear that. Um, he wanted to be focused um, and that the focus was on the literacy and numeracy ambition and actually in that sort of discipline of well what you know what are the things that we are really going to go after and have a kind of laser eye focus on in this white paper um, and I think that does mean that in some cases you know the white the white paper does not set out the totality of the department's work on any given issue so there are a lot of things that we are working uh, very hard with colleagues across government on that absolutely are some of those uh, some of those bigger issues. Um, I think in terms of um, you know the very ambitious targets in the white paper, you know we're clear that there are many, many things outside the white paper and many conversations across government that we will need to have that will need to make that um, that a reality. So I just pick up on that point. Um, and I think just a particular reflection as well on um, thinking about the the implementation of some of this work and I think David spoke about the uh, the need to be um, you know very careful in terms of um, the role of regional schools commissioners uh, to be called regional directors um, and the commissioning conversations they are having locally and I suppose I just wanted to set out that I think that conversation about for example local authority established trust being treated in the same way as any other trust and that being a 
you know, that being a challenging conversation about absolutely there needing to be, um, you know, difficult conversations locally about what is the right direction for any particular school. That is absolutely the, the approach we're trying to um, invoke through, uh, through the white paper. Um, so uh, those were just a couple of points that I wanted to pick up on. Oh, I'm sorry, the final one was, um, I think, again, the your, your final point about the civic responsibility is also something we're thinking about a lot in the department at the moment, I hope to be able to say more about. So that again, just would be something that I'd say, it's not in the white paper, but that doesn't mean it's not the subject of a lot of our conversations. I think it's a really valuable point. Yeah, and there are some really knotty issues, I think, about local governance and whether you pay uh, shares of trustees as well, that um, I think need to be unraveled. But let's hear from our audience now. Can you raise your hand if you have a question for our panel? We'll take a couple at a time, and if you can tell us your name and organisation and keep your question as brief as you can. Okay, you've got one from uh, Gina on the right and then one in the middle here. I'm not sure who I'm looking to for the roving mic. It's the lady in the blue here. Thank you so much. So Gina Cicerone from the Fair Education Alliance. I was delighted to hear all of your contributions and I think a few elephants in the room. So David loved the point around remuneration. I've been banging that drum for 10 years and I was delighted to hear you say that. Julie around poverty, one of the biggest issues. So the other one that I didn't hear was just around funding and the resourcing. Alison, you mentioned resourcing, but not explicitly the funding. And given that the white paper and the schools bill also includes the funding, but we haven't talked about inflation. And I'm really curious as to what needs to be done cross departmentally um, with the Treasury to ensure that we have the adequate resourcing to enable this paper to become a reality and really to level up for all children. Thank you. And we'll take uh, one more from the gentleman in the middle here, please. Thank you. Hello, uh, Peter Lander, for today's purposes, I'll, I'll introduce myself as uh, Chair of Newcastle College Group, so I'm interested to have a chat with you later, Andy, uh, but also Chair of a Special Needs College, which sponsors in the North Academy Trust of 14 Special Needs Academies. The question I've got for the panel uh, is actually about implementation. I was delighted to hear you say, Claire, that uh, you've, uh, I think I, you said you're due to publish an implementation plan. I always think that's a great thing to uh, see uh, alongside um, a bill uh, and a white paper. Um, no one's mentioned the green paper, that's not the purpose of the conference, but one of the things I detected in the green paper, which I was, uh, I thought was very welcome, was actually a move to greater government involvement. And I don't quite agree with the comment about government needs to back off, but government needs to work out where it can add value. And I do think in the past there's been added value from actually the literacy and numeracy strategy in 1997, but the implementation plan stopped and it wasn't thought enough about embedding and taking on to the uh, next stage. Uh, and I would say also there's a, there's a question about the um, academy standards. So it's all very well setting them out, but how, what's the implementation plan going to say for, uh, for uh, how the academy standards will be taken forward and actually made to happen. So a uh, question for anyone on the panel, but whoever you want to uh, point it out and happen. Great, thanks Peter. Um, so, Claire, I'll come to you first for uh, thoughts, particularly on how the department's working with Treasury on funding and resources. And then if anyone else wants to come in on that or the implementation point, um, they're welcome to. Sure. Um, I absolutely hear what you're saying and of course there is a uh, massive programme of work across government which is looking at the implications of you know, the economy and where we are now and what that means for, for all of our public policy. So uh, I'm sure it wouldn't um, uh, surprise you for me to say that you know, all, all of that is very much subject to conversations with the Treasury. Um, I think that uh, notwithstanding the situation in the economy, um, 
it was, uh, in comparative terms across government, a very generous uh, spending review settlement that the Department for Education um, and the school system got at the last spending review, and it really does reflect the government's prioritisation. So um, I think there is an absolutely legitimate question about the erosion of that um, in the context of um, everything else and, and how much more challenging that makes the environment. So I hear that challenge, um, and it is something that uh, a huge number of people in the department and across government um, uh, are working on. I'm afraid I, I don't have a funding rather out of a hat to pull at the moment, but I'm very happy to carry on the conversation. Um, I think uh, I'm terribly interested in all Peter's thoughts. Um, uh, the uh, the thing one of the things I'd just say uh, connected to the academy standards is that um, the white paper did mention a regulatory review um, of the uh, legislative framework underpinning academies. So acknowledging that the bill is taking some initial steps, but actually there is further to go to make that coherent. So the review will be going along alongside the passage of the bill, and quite a lot of what that will inform is what the regulations uh, relating to the academy standards and the implementation looks like. Um, clearly it would be premature on the measures in the bill to have an implementation plan uh, while uh, Parliament is considering the bill, um, but that's the, that's the sequence of events from our point of view. Great, thank you. Does anyone, Alison, do you want to Yes, I just wanted to say that um, the lack of equity across our schools is a huge issue. So whether or not there's any money in the piggy bank, really, we have to make sure that we're giving recognition to the fact that some of our schools are serving communities that are really, really struggling already. And we saw that even more during the pandemic. We saw the divide widen during the pandemic. I think over the next number of years, it really looks quite bleak. So um, I don't know what the answer is, but I think giving some recognition to that. And I, I feel as though it's almost been, um, you know, we haven't been able to say it, because if we say schools are, are dealing and with challenging circumstances with children who haven't got anywhere to study and haven't had enough to eat, that somehow we are um, saying, well, that's about soft expectations. It's not about trying hard enough as a school, you've just got to get on with it. But actually, the reality is all our schools are not in the same circumstance, and it does make the job harder. Hi, yeah, I, I just want to make a point about the regulatory point that, that Peter made, I think, here. So two, two things. First of all, um, we haven't talked about, uh, do you know, did you, use, did you use the phrase elephant in the room? So one of the elephants in the room is Ofsted. Because right now, one of the real challenges that we have is the downward pressure that that, that type of accountability is creating upon the sector. And the, the big risk I see is that we will lose the capacity of great leaders and great teachers to work in our most challenging schools. Because if you get it wrong with Ofsted, it's a career ender. That's the reality. So we, that, 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 that's one point. One way in which we could address some of that in the school inspection system is, is to place a higher premium, a premium and a higher tariff on the performance of schools with their most vulnerable children. So I've seen so many schools in this academic year where the percentage of children with free school meals is pretty low, between 5 and 10 percent would be, would be an example, where the school has been given a good and outstanding judgment, yet the performance with that small group of children is anything but good or outstanding. So, so I think if we were to address that by, by turning that on its head and saying how you do in terms of uh, improving the life chances of your most vulnerable children is credit rather than actually just a, a footnote to it. And then I think the, 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 the same point applies. I, 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 I guess I've probably been on a journey about this because I, I, I grew up in an era, as several people in this room did, being told that uh, we had autonomy as school leaders. Um, and, and I think one of the mistakes that happened in around 2010 when the coalition government came in, it was all about autonomy and not enough about accountability. And certainly from my experience as National Schools Commissioner, there were some very bad examples of Matts who never got the memo. And, and it was basically, you can do what you like and actually, unless you really, really behave badly, then actually nothing much will happen. So I do welcome that because if we're moving to a much more academic system, that has to happen. My hope would be that that is not another element of accountability that's added to Ofsted's to-do list, that we find a better way to do that, because the the success of a trust, using the seven points I've fed out before, uh, yes, it's about outcomes, yes, it's about teaching and learning and curriculum, but it's fundamentally also about how do you ensure that your governance and your financial systems are robust, and Ofsted doesn't look at that. 
So we do need to think differently about that model, I think, if it's going to be there. But I, but I think we do have to have a serious grown-up conversation about that. Great. Thank you. I'll take a couple more questions. Did you, you have your hand up at one point, Mary? Put your pen up. Put your pen up. Um, Mary, and then in the middle Sorry, we're making you go back and forth. Hi, uh, hello everyone. It's Mary Bowsted. I'm Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union. So it's not really a question, although I can put a question at the end. Yes, please. No, is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, there is a question on the way through. So the first, que the first question is autonomy for who? So I was at the International Summit of the Teaching Profession, not last week, but the week before in Valencia, and um, uh, Andrew Schleicher, director of the... Um, of education at the OECD, um, was talking to him uh, about a very good book that someone's written about teacher autonomy. You know, and he said, and the po the, the point he made was, yeah, England, you've got one of the um, highest autonomy for systems and one of the lowest autonomy for teachers. That's that's what he says, looking at looking at the data, and I do think that it, it is when we talk about autonomy. Autonomy for who? Um, so I'm really interested in the centralised curricula, and um, you know, uh, interested in that. Um, the the um, then the, the other question really is the basis on which the um, the argument for moving to a multi academy trust system has been made, because we looked very strongly at the case for a multi strong family schools and the government and Barry Sparrow and others have been really generous in their time talking it through with us um, talks always about strong family schools but when we analyse the data we found that the data if you if you looked at the the, the case produced by the VFE and you reanalyzed it in terms of um, the percentage of deprived children in your school then that was the biggest correlation between whether a school got an outstanding grading or a poor grading when we looked at quintiles of performance. And yet that's completely ab absent from the DfE data. And in fact, we reported it to the National Statistics Authority and and the DfE being criticised for data which lacks transparency and, and um, kind of quite heavy criticism from the NSA. I mean, it's the, you know, poverty is the biggest determinant. And then that's the final thing, really, is my concern, well, I've got two concerns, so I'll ask you in a question. The first is, well, it's fine setting targets, but but do you really think that the, the golden thread of CPD, early career CPD, um, is going to reach these targets for children? And secondly, how do you reconcile the targets for Ofsted, which is a broad and balanced curriculum with implementation impact and whatever, and the other eye, and with these targets? Because it appears to me that we've now got an inspectorate which won't look at internal data and won't look at external data, and we've got then these targets, and that's going to be particularly difficult, I think, for primary schools. So my question is, is the intellectual basis on which this has been made, has it really been, you know, strong family trusts, how are we going to get there? And um, how are we really going to get autonomy? Because I, I think we're not in the place where most, the vast majority of teachers would say they're autonomous at all. Thank you. And then uh, we'll go... Thank you, Susanna Hardiman from Education Charity Action Tutoring. We're a provider under the National Tutoring Programme and generally enjoy working with a number of your wonderful Oasis schools. Um, you can probably guess the theme of my question, but given the ambitions in the bill around literacy and numeracy, I'd be interested to hear from any of the panel about how you think the MTP can be reformed, uh, if indeed it can be reformed, and further embedded in the system to help contribute to meeting these ambitions. Um, I really recognise it's certainly not the only answer, but given it is currently the government's flagship education recovery policy, how can it be maximised to contribute towards these aims? Great, thank you. So I think the, the kind of themes we've got there are where should autonomy lie and does that differ to where we are now in that kind of spectrum of autonomy? Um, has the government won the intellectual case about full academisation? 
and what do you see as the future of the NTP? So I'm going to start with uh, John and then Julie, I'm going to bring you in and then whoever else wants to come in. Oh good, thanks for that. <laughs> so I'll hopefully not appear as angry as I was in the last section, sorry, but this stuff really matters, doesn't it? Um, in trying to answer some of those questions, um, and going back to, to what you were saying earlier about autonomy, I don't think any of us are autonomous. I think in society we have a relationship with each other and we're responsible for each other and we can't work in isolation and if we work in, if we don't work in isolation, we, we're not in community. I, we serve deliberately intentionally some of the most challenging communities across the country. Our community, what we want to be able to do is transform our communities. So, what we've tried to do is think about the activity, the day-to-day -day life of a teacher. So what happens, and for those of us who've been in the teaching profession, normally your Sunday is spoiled because you're planning and replanning all your lessons for the following week. So what we've tried to do as a family of academies is we've tried to save thousands of hours. What we've tried to use is the best evidence-based practice to be able to develop a curriculum which will be tailored locally because we're custodians of our local schools. So the feedback we've had from our teachers who've been involved in the co-construction of that curriculum is that actually what they feel is that they can really now focus on delivery and pedagogy as a focus instead of focusing so much on the content. Now that saves thousands of hours and that's been our learning. Talking about Ofsted, we've had 17 Ofsteds since September, every single one of them positive, and I've got another 12 Ofsteds due in the next few weeks. So yes, that accountability does, you know, that accountability I think is important. I've forgotten the second and third question. Uh, has the government won the intellectual argument about maths as an ambition? And uh, so I'll answer that one. I'll answer that one. Just do one at a time. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a limited person. So I, I think that it's up to the academies, it's up to the education leaders to prove this, not the government. I think that what we're all asking ourselves as academy leaders now, do we deserve to grow? So for example, in Oasis, we're doing really well with a 97% good or better in, in primary but we're not doing as well, for example, in secondary. So do we deserve to grow? Have we not got the capacity to transform the communities we're working in? Go for the next question. Thoughts on the future of the NTP? The NTP are marvellous. <laughs> okay. um, it's, I think it's a mixed economy, to be honest. I think it depends on the children that you're working with. Many of the, some of the students, for example, with special educational needs that we've got, they need to be nurtured by the same person day in, day out. So I think it's about, it's about improving as Dan Allison said, about the quality of teaching, about the quality of teacher training, about the quality of the experience of ECT. So when they're going into environment, when they're going into education investment areas, it makes that big difference because they are confident about dealing with mental health. They are confident about dealing with behaviour management and they can survive those first few years of teaching and then we want them to be able to flourish. We have used NTP. We've also we've brought in additional staff to offset some of our best teachers in our schools to be able to work with those small groups. So I don't think it's one solution. I think it's a mixed economy that's been successful for us to date. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Julie, do you want to come in? I will, thanks Natalie. Okay, I'll take backwards. Um, so the NTP, I mean, I think I think this is one of the huge frustrations at the moment. You know, there, there is so much evidence behind the, the strength of tutoring and the effect that it can have. I think the issue here is with the implementation. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at reform, what we would say is make it simpler, make it make the make the quality consistent, and fully fund it. You know, if we're we're in a, a world where we're moving from at the moment, you know, the, the NTP being uh, being 75, 25 government funded um, into where it'll be is it 60, 40 I think next year, and then eventually down to school zone budgets. If the government's ambition is for this to be part of the system long term, then it has to be part of their thinking about long term funding as well. And I think one of the frustrations around that is the oversell, perhaps, of the tutoring programme. So the Secretary of State, I think, was on one of the, the Sunday morning programmes yesterday talking about every child being able to receive tutoring. I don't think that's helpful. We're not funded as a system for every child to receive tutoring. And I think what that does is it can set up parents against schools in an unhelpful way. And so I think we need to be more open and transparent and realistic about the role that tutoring can play, because I do think it can play an important role. Um, autonomy for who? I think that probably comes back to that point about the role of different players in the system. And I think 
I didn't quite phrase it earlier to say government should get out of the way. I said that government should help to get the stuff out of the way that stops schools from focusing on what they need to focus on. And I think that was your, your point, um, Peter, about what should happen at different levels of the system. And I don't think we are as sophisticated as we need to be about where, to use the autonomy word, um, if we must, where, where autonomy should sit, what should happen at different levels of the system, what should happen at, at uh, central government, local government, other middle tier organisations, trusts, individual schools, individual teachers, and I think we need to be more sophisticated about that. Um, have we yet won the intellectual argument, or has the government won the intellectual argument? Not with everybody. I think it's patchy, and I would agree with John that it's down to trusts to demonstrate their worth. You know, I'm a trustee of a, of a trust in about 25 schools. There are schools that we've been really successful with. There are others that I think we're finding more challenging. And I think, again, it's about openness and transparency that this is a work in progress, and it's a system that we are in the process of developing. Great, thank you. Any other panellists want to come in on any of those before we move on? Perfect. Did I have a question over here? Uh, I've lost the mic. I can just shout if you want. Yeah, that might help. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Dan Walsh from TES. I just wanted, some people have touched on the capacity of the system. I just wanted to give you a frame of what we need more plans. We don't need more people to run them. I think given that we've got the more people to the system, we don't think we don't want to go into leadership roles so much. We went to a recent AHT survey. We don't worry it's not going to have more people who actually run all these maps. Great. For anyone who didn't hear that, Dan asked whether we have enough leadership capacity in the system to get to the government's goal. And I think we had one more. Uh, okay, we'll take this. Yes. Oh, we've got, um, oh, got my phone coming. Thank you. My, name, my name's John Farrell from the Local Government Information Unit. It's, I guess, sort of two um, connected questions. One is we talk a lot about local government and um, fund, I mean, and, and sponsoring maps. But I looked through the bill, there's no um, amendment to the legislation on local government companies that might encourage them to be involved in maps. I just wonder whether that might be something you're planning down the line as to whether you might uh, look to, I mean, because local authorities obviously are not just encumbered, that's the right word, with education legislation these matters. They, also have a vast home of local government laws that they have to work within. The other question is perhaps slightly related. Um, I, I'm conscious that the what we call the funding agreement actually is in legislation an academy agreement. And we we talked a bit about the academy standards which will be implemented by regulations. If, if you actually change that to say grant regulations or even code of regulations use terms going back. Most of what I think you're doing could apply equally to maintain schools. How would it be if you really are interested in encouraging maintain schools? Why not try and actually map out where you're going now with all these various bits of legislation that you want to actually apply in future to academies? Or indeed, maybe you'd find that you don't actually have to canonise some maintained schools because they can fit in with the this new model. I mean, there is a big, big question mark, which I'm Mary sitting in front of me, I want to mention, I suppose, is that's the whole issue of things like qualified teacher status, which I think was relieved of academies in 2012. But apart from that, there are not any great differences, I would have said, between the regulations that apply to maintain schools and those that apply to academies. Thank you. Um, David, I'm going to come to you first on your views on leadership capacity, and then I'll come to you, Claire, on the point about local government. And you see, you've absolutely got that the right way around. <laughs> I've no idea what you're on about, so I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. So. So I think the capacity question is, um, I think you have to couch it, yes, the, the outcome and the, the solution is people, but I think you've also got to first of all work out what it is you're trying to do. So what do you need the capacity for? And the capacity is simply this, that when, when an academy trust signed its funding agreement, uh, it had one charitable object, which was to advance education for public benefit. 
So it is about improving life chances. There was nobody signed a funding agreement in the country that said we were going to make things worse. So, so the question has to be about how do you build the capacity to drive the improvement of standards in schools quicker? Um, and so therefore, I think there are three ways in which you have to think about capacity. One, I think, is about, um, about leadership without a shadow of a doubt, and that's why your question's a good one. Um, I, I, am, I am optimistic about the people that are coming through leading our trusts, partly because they're part of a second generation and they've seen it happen before. So they, they've grown up in that trust. They might have been newly qualified teachers years ago in, 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 in the trust, but they understand how the organisation works. And they've been part of whether it's a talent programme or a succession plan that their career will be developed into those roles. So I, I feel optimistic about that. And I've helped a number of trusts in the last 18 months recruit CEOs. And I'm really heartened by the quality of the fields they've been for those roles. I'm also interested in the fact that there's been a significant increase in the number of people who are coming into the trust sector who don't have the same background as I had of being a, a teacher and a head. Um, and, and I think there's something really interesting about that, because if you're leading a trust of 30 schools, you're leading a really big organisation. And if you have a complex geographical footprint, the reality is that for many heads, that's not their experience. And so it's an interesting challenge to boards. You know, do you need a 31st head teacher or do you need somebody who understands running a complex organisation? And I think, I think we're seeing more and more of that debate. The second area of capacity, which I think is a bigger concern, is about the, the governance system. And it goes back to my point earlier about how, should we, how do we recognise and reward the effort that people have put into to, to that role? Um, and if you take the average size of most trust boards, it's probably between what, 8 and 11 people, something like that. If we were to double the number of trusts or the number of trusts were to grow, I think there's a bigger question mark about whether we've got enough people to do that, particularly when we still want people to play a role at local level as well. And I absolutely believe that that's, that's important. I think those trusts who decided to do away with that local democratic element of it, I think, got themselves into real difficulties. We, we absolutely need that tier of governance too. And then I think the third element, which is, which is an interesting one, which probably wasn't as prevalent when I set up the trust in Bristol 13 years ago now, 15 years ago now, was that concept of the, the leader of school improvement who is no longer based in one school but is working across a number of schools. And, and how do you, to John's point, how do you centralise and systematise some of your processes? Because the bit that I keep coming back to in this debate is that, that children have no agency in this debate. Children don't get a say in the kind of curriculum they give. They have no say in who teaches them. They have no say in the timetable. So the adults have got to do that right. And I just slightly worry that with the ambitions that we have, before the white paper came out, but certainly since, I don't think we're going to get there if we simply redesign the experience classroom by classroom across the country. So we need our strongest, most credible school improvers to work alongside school leaders to really accelerate that journey. And I think that there are people who absolutely understand that, who are currently middle leader roles, who are currently in assistant head roles or deputy head roles, who are ready to do that. But I think the biggest challenge we've got is around the governance piece. Before we come on to Claire, Alison, interrupt from your thoughts about the Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that when we look at the white paper, there's recognition that it's primary schools that need persuading. And primary schools are a very different kettle of fish from much bigger secondary schools, where you've got lots of small schools with maybe only three, four members of staff. Capacity does become an issue when you start to look at how you're going to manage those schools across an area. So I think it's something, it's not to say that it's impossible or that it's undesirable, but it is something that needs to be looked at, not just as small versions of secondary schools, but actually, you know, what are the needs of primary schools? Who needs to be on the premises, available for anybody who comes in, to, wants to meet with uh, whoever's in charge? You know, you do need to be able to be responsive in that environment. So it's just another challenge to, uh, to add to the list. Thank you. Um, so, legislation relating to local government, so um, very much aware of the constraints and the challenges um, of uh, kind of requirement for local government around companies. Um, I'm afraid there's, there's not an intention, it, it's not in the bill by, um, uh, it's not in the bill, not as a result of accident, um, but that's not something that the government is intending to take forward, so we will need to kind of work around that uh, as a constraint. I think the issue in terms of the academy standards and uh, requirements on the maintained schools is, is an interesting one um, and definitely uh, as part of the 
development for the bill and the discussion. You know, there have been a lot of legal conversations about what the intent is and the different uh, different ways to uh, to achieve that. Uh, I think actually there are other than QTS. There's obviously things around the national curriculum. There's quite a number of um, there's quite a number of things, some of which are very technical that um, that don't apply to academies. So. Um, I think it's not as straightforward as a translation, but I, I think it's a you know I think it's a valid point. Uh, I would, uh, to some extent, sort of rely on the loops we've gone around with legal colleagues in terms of the different permutations of possibilities and the pros and cons of them. And um, certainly, we we feel like in terms of what we are trying to achieve, uh, the proposal in the bill is is the right one. But I don't dispute that there are you know, other ways of trying to crack the same issue. Great, thank you. Um, we are frustratingly running out of time. I'm going to take one final question. Andrew, did you, you had your hand Andrew. up last time. Okay. I, I, I'd like to just ask you something about church role in education now. Um, the ch we're talking about a strong family of schools. In some areas, the church, the concept of a mixed mass is all about a school joining a church mass. I wondered why we haven't had the opportunity in this for non-church schools to join a non-church method, non-church governance, but retain their church, the church that, that seems to be great, but it, does, it doesn't seem to happen. In fact, it seems that we're strengthening the role of the church. Okay. I... <laughs> Sorry, Claire, you're getting all the technical ones. Before you uh, come in on that, in order to wrap up, I'm going to come to all of the other panellists in a moment, starting with Julie and coming down the line, and I'd like to hear the one thing in the white paper that you are most excited about. Um, but Claire, church schools. I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question because I lost the sort of... Okay, if you're a church school and you, want, if, and you want to join a MAT, you can only join your church MAT. Yeah. If a church school wants to join a non-church map, they can't. As a non-church map can join the church map. it seems that the mixed map concept only goes one way and it destroys some communities of schools that want to work together. I work in a town with 13 schools and there are six maps and two of them are church maps. It just seems to me against the concept of families and schools working together. Okay, I think I've got that now. You. Yes, I, I, yeah, I have. Thank you very much for repeating it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think absolutely yes. There are a number of different things we're balancing here in terms of um, in terms of local interests and in terms of what's going to work in an area. Um, I, I want to be really honest and say I don't know the answer. I think it's a really valid question. I will take it back to my colleagues and investigate in more detail. In the bill, you might not have known the answer, but you put something in the bill which actually is very relevant to it, which is even more worrying if you don't know the answer. Well, it might not have been Claire personally. Well, I just represented the auditor. <laughs> sure, so uh, I had nothing to do with the authorship of the bill. Um, I was involved in the white paper. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John, do you want to come in on, on that? Yeah, just um, we've had numerous church schools who wanted to join the Oasis Community Learning. We haven't been able to make, we haven't been able to sort of lessen the dissonance of that. Because when we talk about admissions and any child being able to come and join your school, that doesn't happen in a church. So it's based on selection. So it's always ended when we get to the diocese or we get, for example, to the, the bishop or the archbishop, wherever it may be. Um, there's always, it stops there because we want to be able to include any child, regardless of their starting point, etc. And that's about the level playing field. And I think that's why I called, that's why I called into question earlier. It's, we're not in a level playing field but we're treating it as such. And I think what we need to do is understand the diversity and the clarity of the system we're in and what the MAT sector is expected to do within that. Great, thank you. And then just to uh, close up the panel discussion, um, we'll go down the line starting from Julie. What are you most excited about in the white paper? Oh, sorry, we haven't got a mic. That's all right, give me another 30 seconds to uh, decide on my answer. Um, I think it is around a sort of conceptual move, I think, in the white paper from away from autonomy, which I agree is probably not a helpful term, towards a more collaborative approach. So we've been talking a lot at ASCAL about the over the last few years about collective local responsibility, 
uh, and thinking about mechanisms for how we can help organise, we can collectively work together, the organisations that used to perhaps to think of themselves as more autonomous to work collectively and to think about uh, all of the children and young people in a local area. I don't think that's easy, I don't think the white paper has all the answers to that, but I think there's something of a conceptual shift there which is helpful. So I think mine would be something that I think is both implied and stated, which is the importance of every child having a great teacher. Uh, and, I, and I say that simply because I think of all of the years I've been doing this now, I'm more convinced than ever that the only intervention that works is to improve the quality of teaching in classrooms day in, day out. Thank you. Um, I would say collaboration, uh, that notion of uh, leadership, of hope, driven by colleagues working together for the best interests of all the children in their area, that for me, um, I think is 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 excellent and if that's the response from the profession then we've got um, we're in good hands. For me it's macro ambition uh, to level up uh, to try to give equal levels of opportunity for all. Um, the execution is tough uh, but the ambition is the right one. I think it's building on the momentum that the white paper has started so I think that doesn't mean we have to agree on all of the proposals, we never will, but I think it's really helpful to have a clear statement of government ten intent that we can work collectively on, um, and I think the word collaboration is really key for me. I think there's nothing in the white paper that we're not really keen to be having a conversation with all of you on over the coming months. I think, <laughs> I think that um, over the last few years there's almost been sort of a vacuum of leadership around education and I think it's good to have a structural conversation but I think for many of the education leaders that I'm speaking to I think it's in, it's created a really good conversation that actually you don't enact change through the government you enact change through education leaders working together collaborating and I think it sparks that debate that we're having today which I think is the important bit because we, you really realize where the power in the system lies it lies with educators to do the best we can with our communities Thank you so much. Um, that draws the uh, seminar today to a close. Um, there are, before you all rush off, there are drinks just in the lobby here, so we encourage you to stay and network with us for a little while or, uh, until we get kicked out by Andy. Um, thank you so much to our panel for taking the time, particularly Claire for stepping in at the last minute for Baroness Barron. Thank you to Andy, Niccolo and colleagues at Capita for hosting us today and to all of you for participating and your great questions. Um, please keep following EPI because we've got lots more events planned over the summer and into the autumn as well. So thank you and hope to see you for a drink in a moment.